What's up, Trail and Ultra people? I am Stephanie Howe, and I'm filling in for Jason Coop, who's out traveling the globe right now on an athlete project. I'll be here for a few episodes, um, talking to you with some really exciting guests lined up. Today, I have a good friend of mine, Dr. Claire Bernard Miller. She's going to talk to us a little bit about common injuries in runners and how thinking about it from another point of view might help us to overcome these injuries and not just treat the symptom. I've personally learned a lot from Claire over the past couple of years working with her as my physical therapist to learn some more about my body and how my feet are kind of the uh, Achilles heel, if you will, of most of my problems. It's been really great to to learn um, and to be able to troubleshoot and uh, think of ways to to fix my issues or to help my issues in in a different way. Claire is full of information and has gone through a lot herself as a runner. So she has the professional background as a doctor of physical therapy, but then also she's a runner. She's been injured and she understands what that's like. Claire is the founder, owner of um, her practice in Fairfax, California, Activate Wellness and Physical Therapy. And she's also a virtual practitioner for Gate Happens, which is a uh, clinic based out of Colorado that focuses on the feet and the gait and treats endurance runners of all sorts, but particularly runners. And so today we'll talk through some of those things, what Claire has learned, how she approaches injuries, how she approaches working with runners, and hopefully you'll learn something. Um, I learned something, I always do, and I hope you really enjoy this conversation. So sit back and grab a notebook and a pen and get ready to learn a lot from Claire. Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm good. I'm great. How are you? Uh, I'm good. We're talking on opposite coast right now. Um, we're over in Maine and I'm over in France. So we have a close to time difference going on. I'm uh, in the dark in my backyard and uh, yeah, it looks like it's midday over there. Yeah. I'm in my in-laws house in their living room and uh, it's a nice like 60s ish outside versus the heat wave in uh, California right now. Yeah, we, we're both from the Bay Area and they're experiencing a heat wave over 100 degrees. So I think we're both very glad not to be there right now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So Claire, really excited to talk to you today and learn a little bit um, about just what you do, how you can help runners. Um, but before we get into that, let's just go through an introduction. Um, so where are you from? Uh, where did you go to school? What got you into physical therapy? Cool. Yeah. Um, so my name is Claire Bernard Miller. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, and then I moved to DC for college. I went to Georgetown. Um, and then I met my now husband there. We moved out to San Francisco um, in 2013. And then I went to PT school at UCSF. And uh, now we still live out there in Fairfax, California. Um, Yeah. So we love Fairfax. And uh, I started my own practice kind of in the heart of COVID. Um, I left my job at a... uh, pretty high paced outpatient orthopedic facility um, and went out on my own. And now my practice is activate physical therapy and wellness in Fairfax, California. Yeah, very, very cool. And was very excited for you to take that leap. It's it's a big thing to, to start your own business, uh, especially in the middle of COVID. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely a leap. Um, I knew that I always wanted to Um, own my own business and do my own physical therapy practice. Um, But I probably wouldn't have thought I would do it in 2020, but um, COVID was kind of the impetus to do it. So um, that was one kind of highlight that came out of COVID for me. So So let's, let's move up a little bit and um, talk about just your, I guess you said you grew up in Cincinnati and you went to Georgetown and you were an athlete as well. And so you've been a runner 
um, and you run, cycle, swim now. Um, but talk a little bit about your background in sports and how that maybe brought sure. you into uh, what you do now. Sure. Yeah. So I'll start back uh, in like elementary school. I uh, well, actually, before that, I dabbled in lots of sports. I did like figure skating. Um, I also played cello, not a, not necessarily an athletic activity, but um, then I did soccer. Um, and then going into so my um, high school, it was kind of like a middle school high school. So entering seventh grade, I missed the soccer tryouts because um, we were on a family vacation. So one of my friends said, hey, do you want to go to this cross country uh, practice? And I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. And we ran around a, um, a cemetery. And uh, <laughs> and yeah, I just kind of was hooked from there. So I, I joined the cross country team in seventh grade. Um, and then I did it through high school. Um, and then I did the club team running at Georgetown for a little bit. And I met one of my best friends, um, through that running club. Um, and then Levi, my husband ran for the Georgetown team. Um, so running's just been a big part of my life, part of our life. Um, and then through my own injuries is how I came about to find physical therapy and the amazing things and impact physical therapists can have on people, um, which really inspired me to get into physical therapy myself. Um, and then through my own injuries, I've also found uh, really a passion for other sports. I mean, running's always going to be my love and my, f like, that is what I would do every day if my body could handle that. But I've also been able to find like a love and a camaraderie and like a social um, community around cycling and swimming too. So um I don't do them all together. I'm not a triathlete, but I do enjoy all of those three sports. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that. And I really love that you have been injured before. I mean, I'm not happy for you that you've been injured, but I think it makes you understand and it makes it more, you know, like when you learn things, you can be really book smart and you can know all the science and all the research. But if you haven't gone through it yourself, that's like a whole different different arm of uh, of working with someone. And so having been injured yourself and really finding your passion in helping people to, to get back to their sport um, and maybe find sports that support their body, I think is is a really important thing and, and really cool. I think it makes you more relatable and you're able to apply all of your knowledge uh, to people because you've been there. Yeah. And I think I use myself as like, a um, an experiment or like, I, I just, I delve into the areas that I've struggled with my, on my own and use that to help other people. So like my kind of, I, I would say I'm ever evolving in, in the things that I'm interested in, but the things that have kind of stuck with me, um, and, and also because of my own injuries have been like the pelvis and the foot and the ankle. Um, and through my, those are, those have kind of been like the two biggest injuries that I've dealt with. Um, but through that, that's really kind of like guided my career along with pregnancy and having a baby, um, to, to really dive deep into those areas and help other people. Yeah, that's that's a great segue. So let's talk a little bit about the foot and gait happens. And I personally have learned a lot from you about myself. And um, a lot of other runners I know have learned so much about thinking about injuries in a different way or how things start from the foot and work up. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, gait happens and how did you, well, what is it to start? What is gait happens? Yeah, great question. So Gate Happens is a, um, a company um, started by Courtney Conley and Jen Perez. And um, they're two chiropractors out of Colorado. Um, and funny, and so, so they've actually created their business on Instagram and, and they're working to, to kind of reach a, a larger market, but um, they help people from all over the world. So I joined um, their team probably like a year and a half ago, treating virtually. Um, and so 
we treat people from all over the world, which is super cool. Like I'll get on a call. I mean, just like we're on a call now across the world. Um, similarly, I'll get on a call with somebody in Hong Kong and talk about their foot and watch them walk and watch them move um, and look at their range of motion, their mobility, their strength, and uh, then give them exercises. So it's, it's really cool um, the way that uh, these two chiropractors have set up this business. Um, and not only do they do virtual consultations, but they give so much free information out there through Instagram, which is kind of weird. Like I never would have thought Instagram would be part of my, um, like job, which I'm sure a lot of people say, but like me specifically, I'm horrible with social media. Um, and this company has grown through that, um, and so they, so if you go and follow them on Instagram, you just find out ton, it's basically like lower body health. So we say both, we look from both the top down and from the bottom up. So if somebody's coming up to me with big toe pain, we can't just look at the big toe. We have to look, okay, what's the driver of the system? What's the stabilizer of the body? Like how is the core and pelvis functioning? Um, and, and how is the foot functioning? Um, so that's kind of like uh, a big overview of Gate Happens. Um, and then they also do courses. So courses for the general population. So you could go and just do their foot health 101 course and just learn a little bit about overall body func lower body function. Or if you're like a healthcare practitioner, they do continuing education courses. And they just started um, an in-person course uh, this year, it's called Functional Gait Assessment. And I actually had the opportunity of teaching that course in July. Um, and I'm going to teach it about two or three times in 2023 around the country, um, which is super exciting. Um, but so that course is for healthcare practitioners and you learn gait assessment. So then you can take all that information and help your clients. Yeah. It's super cool information. And I, I love the videos um, and learning just about how different things in the foot, like things that I haven't even thought of, probably a lot of runners haven't even thought of, um, are important for our ability to run. So like, uh, for example, big toe flexibility for me has been something that I really struggle with and not really connecting that that's why I have some of the issues that I have. So I really like the, the Instagram account of the the, you know, simple exercises and just connecting some of those dots, um, I think is, is a really great resource for so many runners. And like you were saying, the, the virtual consultations, that's another really cool thing that we have that maybe, you know, a few years ago wasn't so much of an option, but working with someone, um, you know, across the globe, watching them walk and being able to help them troubleshoot, I think is a really cool way that we're expanding our access to um, providers who can really, who can really help us and who are really experts in the field. So how did yeah. you um, first get introduced to Get Happens? Did that come through a personal like injury, like seeking them out or was it something professionally that you guys connected? It was, um, it was both actually. So when I was at um, my former job, I was treating a girl, a high school girl um, dancer and um, she had a neuroma, which for those people that don't know, it's kind of like a, a irritation of the nerves between um, some of your toes. Um, and so for dancers, it's common because they're, you're just wearing like really narrow toe, like your ballet shoes or your point shoes or the dance shoes are so narrow and you're up on your toes. And so it can get really irritated. Um, and so I was doing the things that I knew from PT school to help her. And it was like, okay. It was like just getting her by and she would come in and it would be a little better. But then like, we never really got anywhere. Like we were just kind of treating the symptoms and not the actual cause. Um, and I just got kind of frustrated. Like I would then pass her off to the aid uh, and just not really like, I just didn't have any exercises to give her that I actually thought were helping. So then I started looking on Instagram for, for other ideas. And that's when I came across Gate Happens. Um, and 
then it was very eye-opening. I, I was like, wow, I don't know any of this stuff. And, and I feel like I should. <laughs> um, and so then I just started following them. Um, they were hosting a course in LA. This was before COVID. Um, and so I went to one of the courses um, and then I sought out Courtney um, for my own foot. I fractured my calcaneus. And so I tried to um, treat myself and did a lot of the stuff that I knew and that I had learned from them. Um, but I kind of had like a, a big setback. We did this like brick project and I like rebroke my foot by lifting too many bricks. Um, and so then I, I sought her out for a virtual consultation um, and also wanted to see like, how do these virtual consultations work? Um, so yeah, I kind of connected with her there and then I, and then I joined their, um, it's called a gate guru membership um, where that's healthcare practitioners. It's also an amazing uh, thing that they do as well, where um, any healthcare practitioner who's interested in this kind of stuff can join this membership and they do monthly Zoom calls and they do continuing education. Um, so I did that and I basically did like all of their different courses. I was just really interested in all of it because, I mean, I think we, me as a healthcare practitioner will continue to learn like throughout my career. Um, and I love learning about things that I don't know about and that I are like, very applicable to the patient population that I see. Um, so I, yeah, I did their, um, their courses and their membership. And then they reached out to me um, saying that they were looking to hire another virtual practitioner um, and asked if I would be interested. So uh, they hired, so it was Jen and, and Courtney, and then they hired myself and a woman, Erin out of um, Ohio and, um, to be two more virtual practitioners. And since then they've hired two others from North Carolina as well. So um, it's, it's cool to see their company growing and it's really cool to be a part of it. Um, and I've learned so much through them that has also helped my own practice. And I think what's another wonderful thing about Gate Happens is that they really want to help promote my own business and Aaron's own business and everybody pretty much, I guess all six of us now have our own businesses and um, they're, they're trying to help bring people into our doors because they all do virtual. If somebody's in the Bay area and they want to see me in person, they come to my business. Mm -hmm. um, I also do virtual through my own business, um, but they kind of really promote like people coming in person to my business in Fairfax. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's really cool to work synergistically. And yeah. I love that. Um, I mean, you know, you learn so much when you go to school, like I've gone to school um, for a long time as well. I have a PhD and you learn so much, but there's so much that you don't know. And you realize that the more you learn, the less you know. And so searching out more knowledge and how can it help people more, it, it requires things like that. And like I said earlier, it's just really cool that we have the opportunities to connect in those ways so that we can be uh, the best we can to, to help uh, other people. So I'm curious. Um, so a runner comes to you um, or comes to Gate Happens and they like, I'll just use me, like my, my yeah. Achilles is bothering me and I really want you to look at my foot. I want to figure out what's going on. So what does that process look like? How would a runner who wants to connect with you or with Gate Happens, like what would that process be like? Yeah. So I'll give an example. So great example of the Achilles. I actually just treated a guy yesterday virtually um, through my own business. Um, so he just found me um, and signed up online. And so if, if you're, if I'm treating you virtually, I have you send me um, videos of you walking and running. If you're a runner running um, both walking barefoot and then running in your normal running shoes from like a side view and a back view and a front view. Um, so I can just see how you move. And then I have you send me pictures of you standing and then like a close up of your feet from the front side and back. Um, so I can kind of get an idea of what does your overall posture look like and how do you move before we go into like a virtual consultation? If you come into me in person, I do all of that in my office. Um, 
And I'll oftentimes throw someone on the treadmill, but there's actually quite a few number of people that like have no idea to how to walk on a treadmill. So <laughs> I'm like, do you feel like you're walking normally? And then if they're like, uh, not really, I'll just like have them walk outside, um, which is pretty funny. But also understandable because like there's a good number of people who have never been on a treadmill before. Um, so anyway, so yeah, I'll, I'll have you, I'll see the way that you move, see your posture. Um, what's a benefit of coming in person is I can feel um, like your the joints or the soft tissue of your foot, of your Achilles. Um, and, and then I'll, I'll do um, an assessment of, I oftentimes love to look at people's heel raises because that gives me a good um, indicator of how strong your gastroc, your soleus is, your posterior tib, how well you're able to supinate and pronate your feet. I think one um, area where um, kind of like popular media has give, done a disservice at this point is thinking like pronation is bad. Mm. Pronation is not bad and supination is not better. Pronation and supination are very normal parts of the gait cycle. We need both and we need to be able to control both. Um, so that oftentimes will um, have to do with like an Achilles problem. Um, bunions are a lot of um, things that I see um, neuromas, a lot of like, I mean, forefoot injuries are actually the most common injuries. Um, maybe not in runners, but just in the general population. And that's actually because of our footwear, hmm. because most of our modern day footwear has a, like a narrow toe box. And so that's just cramming your toes into a bad position. And that's what leads to most bunions, um, most forefoot injuries. Um, but kind of going back to Achilles, um, Achilles depends on if it's mid-belly or insertional Achilles tendonitis, um, and that will kind of lead to two different paths of how to treat it. And then, um, because I know your feet very well, um, <laughs> we'll talk about like a rigid foot type. So rigid foot types are called Pez Cavus foot types, and I have a similar foot type. And those are um, like feet that like people think like high arches or like like a good arch. Um, you don't have a problem with supination, but it's harder to get you to pronate. Mm -hmm. So that's where a lot of like lateral insertional Achilles tendonitis will um, come about or Haglund's deformity or any sort of like kind of lateral injury up the chain. So think like IT band, things like that. Um, a lot of a lot more lateral issues because if this is my foot and this is my heel, I'm just like loading the lateral side and you're not able to get to the medial side of the foot. Pronating is pronating. I think this is probably good to um, explain is where your arch is lengthening and supination is where your arch is shortening. So um yeah. So then I'll, uh, what did I say? I said, look at heel raises, look at big toe range of motion, look at dorsiflexion range of motion, and then kind of do like a muscle, just a general muscle screen. Uh, and then look at hip stabilization, core stabilization. Um, we can't just look at the foot. We have to look at what's driving the foot as well. Mm -hmm. That's a very general. Yeah. Overview. No, no that, that's great. And it's, it's good to hear because I think people are curious about how a virtual consultation would work and like how you actually can see. And I, I think that's, you know, you, you can see everything you need to see from a video and photos and watching the body move, I think is, um, you know, key to, to learning about a different body and, and what it needs. Um, I'm curious if you have any recommendations or just anything uh, runners can think about for their feet. So say I don't have an injury right now, but I want to make sure that I'm, I'm doing the things to prevent an injury. So are there certain things with the feet that you can do to just be proactive about, um, keeping your, your feet healthy or things that tend to be, I, I don't know if they're, they're tight or tend to be stiff in runners. Um, what would you recommend? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think overall foot strength is really important. So uh, one thing I didn't mention uh, about like when somebody comes in is 
most of the time I check, like, what does their foot intrinsic strength look like? So foot intrinsics are small muscles that start and end in your feet. So we've got so many muscles in our feet and most people don't even know the muscles. Um, And so I like to test toe yoga. So toe yoga is where you lift your big toes up, keeping your small toes down, and then you switch. Can you push your big toes down, lift your small toes up? So there's varying degrees of ability to do this. Some people cannot dissociate their toes at all. So that's just a great place to start. So even if you've like, and it's kind of like a brain game too. Your brain is telling your your toes to move and some people can't move them at all. So, so that's when I'll have somebody, okay, just use your hands. One hand is pressing down on the small toes. The other hand is pulling up on the big toe. Try to hold that. Okay, then switch. And so, uh, and some people would like use their fingers to do it while they're moving their toes. Um, oftentimes you'll have one side that's easier to move than the other. And so then I say, okay, use your stronger side to teach your weaker side. Um, and so that simple exercise of just dissociating your big toes from your small toes um, is a great intrinsic foot muscle strengthening exercise. And then to get more picky about it, if you're able to move your toes without your hands helping, um, don't let the rest of your foot move. So don't let your foot pronate as you're lifting your small toes up. Don't let your to- your small toes scrunch into the ground as you're lifting your big toes up. So there's like varying um, abilities and kind of like... Um, degrees to which you can work that exercise. And that's a really easy one to do. You just have to have your shoes off. You don't need any equipment. Um, So that's foot um, control. And then um, I think soleus strength is a really, really big uh, need in runners. So your soleus is your deeper calf muscle. It makes up two thirds of your Achilles tendon, and it can take up to 11 times your body weight when you're running. So soleus strength, um, so the way that you would target your soleus is a bent knee calf raise. So if you just think of like a heel raise, a calf raise, same thing, a straight leg is like what people normally think about. So you're lifting your heels up, you're going onto the balls of your feet. You always want to think about pressing through your big toes because your big toe provides 80% of stability in your foot and your ankle. There is a reason why your big toe is a bigger bone than your small toes. We want to access that big toe bone. So um, to target the soleus, you would bend your knees a good amount. So you could either do like a bent knee calf raise, or I love to do wall sit calf raises. So if you think about a wall sit, like most people think to go down to 90 degrees, I have people go into a shallow wall sit. So we want to target the soleus and the soleus is targeted by 60 degrees of knee flexion. So if you think about your knees bent at 90 degrees for a normal wall sit, you would go to 60 degrees. So it's more shallow. That's kind of like this angle. I don't know if people can are watching this, but um, so just a shallow wall sit and then you're holding that and then you're lifting your heels up and slowly lowering. And a lot of people will shake, their legs will shake right away as they're lowering. Um, and then you can load that up by holding weight on your thighs. And um, so you really want to load up your, your um, soleus so that it can withstand all of the impact forces in running. Yeah, I'm, I'm smiling because uh, these are two things that I have done and I struggle with. The toe yoga, for one, I am one of those people that would just like, it's like rubbing, patting your head and rubbing your stomach at the same time. I just, like, <laughs> totally. it's so hard for me. It's like mental focus. And I definitely use my hands just like, yeah. pretending, like <laughs> my toes will follow my hands. Um, it's but awesome. it's such a good thing to do. And then those uh, soleus calf raises um, also just, incredibly hard. So I think, you know, and I, I'm, I've been a runner for uh, most of my life. Um, yeah. and I've run a lot and that's super challenging for me. So yeah. it's, it's sometimes we always think 
we don't always think, but a lot of times we think that training and um, running hard, that's going to make us a better athlete. But if we don't focus on those little things, the foundation, slow down, take your time, work on your feet, work on your imbalances, um, you're missing out on a lot and potentially missing out on something that could uh, prevent an injury in the future. So I I really like, this is good for me to hear right now because I have not been doing my hill raises, which I'm going to promptly do after this call. Um, (laughs) But uh, yeah, that's that's really, uh, I think a lot of people can do both of those. They're very simple, Um, especially the toes. You know, you, I think it's easy to ignore your feet. Um, mm-hmm. they're just in shoes and you know, we don't, they're, they're not like a muscle that gets sore that we massage. And, um, there's so many things that they can, uh, that I guess there's so many things that can go wrong because the feet are, are not functioning. They're not absorbing or they're not controlling, uh, movement. Like you said. Yeah, exactly what you just said. Um, <laughs> and I think not only for injury prevention, but also for performance, like if you can access that powerhouse, that soleus muscle, like not only will that benefit you because you'll be able to run more and without injury, but you'll be able to perform better, which I think a lot of people want yes. as well. Yes, definitely. Um, so let's change topics just a little bit and talk about your other area that you've been focusing on, which is um, the pelvis. And I, I think that's kind of something that we, we know the word, people know what a pelvis is, but they don't really understand how it's related to running. And I think, um, you know, why, why, why is the pelvis important? Um, and like what we can talk about it in, in terms of like postpartum and pregnancy, but also just for every runner, I think can benefit from learning a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So why is the pelvis important? So the pelvis I mean, it is a it is a big part of your skeletal system, um, and it's kind of like what connects your legs to the rest of your body, pretty much. Um, and everybody has a pelvis. Um, your pelvis is part of your core canister, a big part of your core canister. And so we've talked about the feet and the importance of foot strength and calf strength, but your pelvis and your core are really the big stabilizers of your body. So if you don't have a strong, stable base, your legs can't move with good mechanics. So I would say the the pelvis and the core is where you have to start. So if somebody comes into me with like a foot problem, but their core control is they have none, we can't we can't get anywhere with the foot unless we have we can work on their their pelvis and their core stability first. Um, so it's really like the driver of your whole body. And so what does your core consist of? It consists of your respiratory diaphragm on top, your pelvic floor on the bottom, your deep abdominals. So your abdominal corset. So that's your deep abdominal muscles and some small muscles in your back. And then what, what some muscles that are often forgotten about are the deep hip rotators. And they, um, I wish I had my pelvic model here, but um, they, your, the deep hip rotators help suck the f- uh, femur into the hip socket and also support the pelvic floor. So your pelvic floor is a bowl of muscles that sits on the inside of your pelvis um, and it helps support your bowel and bladder function um, and also supports all the impact of uh, the forces when you're running. So um, your pelvic floor works with your respiratory diaphragm to control your the intra-abdominal pressure. So it works with your respiratory diaphragm. So when you breathe, the two muscles are working together. So, um, so those of those people that can't see your, um, your respiratory diaphragm is a dome. Um, and if you think about your rib cage, it's kind of like the, um, it's like an umbrella. And then your pelvic floor is like an inverted umbrella. It's, so there's two, um, semicircles. Um, and so when you're breathing in, your um, diaphragm contracts down and your lungs fill with air. In order to respond to that, your pelvic floor um, expands down. 
And then on your exhale, your diaphragm goes back to its resting position and your pelvic floor lifts up to help control that intra-abdominal pressure in the same way. So it's all about control of the pressure and um, it your pelvic floor functions with your breath. So I don't think a lot of people know that. Um, and the, and it's all about stability with running. So, um, some people will have stress fractures in their pelvis. So that's like pubic stress fractures, sacral stress fractures. Mm -hmm. Those are two really common ones. Um, femoral neck stress fractures have a lot to do with the control of the deep hip rotators. Um, and so that's a big reason why runners should care about um, the pelvis. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a whole list of other things that um, uh, of why the pelvis is important um, for running, but those are kind of what pop into my head right, uh, right away. So how can we work? We know it's important. How can we work on our pelvic floor then? Um, it, knowing that it is the core um, of our our stability, um, yeah. what are some things we can do to to make sure that it's it's functioning correctly? So breathing, breathing is the first place to start, um, and it's kind of breathing is a lot of times overlooked by people. Kind of like the toe yoga exercise, like people are like, oh yeah, yeah, okay, I did it once, I'm I'm good. But really, that's how you control. Um, your pelvic floor. And for runners specifically, because it's, in it's a high impact activity, oftentimes our pelvic floor will be hypertonic, which means that it's in a constant state of contraction. So if you, and I like to give the analogy of a biceps, um, like a bicep, a bicep curl. So if you think about a bicep curl, you're straightening your arm and then you're fully bending your arm and then you're going to straighten your arm again. And oftentimes it's with weight. So if you weren't able to fully extend your arm and your arm was stuck at like 90 degrees and then you're only going into full um, bending and then back to 90 and you're just doing a bicep curl with that range of motion, you're never going to get the full strength of your biceps. That You can take that analogy into the pelvic floor because if you're never able to lengthen the pelvic floor, then you're never able to fully strengthen it. So in a hypertonic pelvic floor, you're just constantly trying to contract it. Your body is trying to control that pressure, um, but it's just in a contracted state. So you're never able to get that full strength of those muscles. Um, so for the breathing exercise, and maybe we can link like the toe yoga exercise and this breathing exercise into like the show notes or something, um, because I have a good... Um, breathing exercise video. Um, and so I would say focus on more of the relaxation part rather than the contraction um, mm -hmm. for most runners. And that's a very overgeneralization, but you can't really go wrong with just first working on the relaxation of your pelvic floor. Uh, I think breathing exercises are another thing that are easy to do. We just need to make time to do them. And again, it's all those little things um, and knowing that it is important uh, for your running, uh, for performance. And um, I, I think too, learning about the pelvis and the pelvic floor and how it is interrelated with everything else in your body. Like you said, your femur, you know, that connects into your pelvis. That's an important part of, of running. Um, I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit about uh, how you, how you treat uh, people when they come in for a, a session or I guess how like hip pain can be treated through pelvic, uh, PT work? Because I think that's something that is maybe new, at least in, um, I, I'm not in, in that world. So it's new to me, like learning about this and learning that this is an option and that this is something that we do. We, we treat people like this and especially we can talk about, um, pregnancy and postpartum too, but, um, what does that look like for, for treating some, uh, different conditions? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, hip pain, um, I mean, can be, a lot of different things, but very common in runners. Um, so I, um, 
similarly to what I was saying with the foot, um, I'll have somebody walk and I'll have somebody run, um, look at their muscle strength, look at their mobility. Um, and then I'll usually ask about like history of childbirth, history of any trauma to the pelvis. Um, and there are a lot of things I can do externally um, to help with hip pain. But um, if it's more of like, okay, I think the pelvic floor is implicated in this. Um, I only uh, treat internally uh, with females at this point. I haven't done the training for males. Um, so uh, with females, I will say, um, I'll kind of explain what I was talking about with breathing. Um, and then I'll say, uh, or, or I'll, I'll explain like what an internal exam would look like. Um, and I usually devote a separate session to an internal exam if that if I think that's warranted and the patient is interested in it. It's not something that has to be done. Um, but in order to really understand if the person is fully relaxing their pelvic floor and fully contracting their pelvic floor, an internal exam is the best way to assess that. Along yeah. with that. Oh, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, and I think that's like a really, it's just something that I, I didn't know existed until I was pregnant and I, I um, sought out treatment. And I think it's, it can do so much. Like you said, it's, you, you can, you can do so much more. And so I think it's a really up and coming area and I'm, I'm really glad we're talking about it and hopefully spreading the word that this is, um, something that, that can help a lot of different problems. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll even speak for my, uh, like with personal experience, I, in PT school, I was running a lot and I had a pubic, um, stress reaction, pubic bone stress reaction. Um, and I went to so many people under the sun to try to figure out why, um, uh, or how to get this, like after I had done the rest and, Kind of the progression back to running, I was still having pain. And I went to a pelvic PT and I went to a chiropractor and massage. And like, I went down all of these roads and I even thought about like going to Dr. Myers in Philly to get adductor surgery because I just couldn't get this pain to go away. And it wasn't until finding the right pelvic PT for me that she really helped. And like now she's one of my mentors because I've learned so much from her and I want to help other people just in the same way that she's helped me. But it made such an impact on my life because I was just in constant pain for years. Um, and it was really like, I had seen another pelvic PT who was also great, but it just wasn't the right one for me. Um, and so I think that there is so much um, opportunity to help other people and running specifically. Like at that point I had not had a baby and I was not thinking about um, children at all, but it was just the impact of running and the, um, the lack of control in my pelvis and my core um, that caused so much stress to my left pubic bone. Um, and so, yeah, I think that, all runners could benefit from pelvic PT. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think, you, you know, you have to find the right person for you and almost be an advocate for yourself of like, if something isn't working to keep seeking out and, and learning about what's out there. Um, and again, this yeah. is really good information because I think a pelvic uh, PT isn't something that's widely known. So hopefully uh, spreading this message will just make a difference in a few people's lives who maybe are struggling and just haven't figured out answers to like, you know, like you said, having this pain and not being able to figure it out. So, um, right. I think like most people think about pelvic P or like, hopefully people are thinking about pelvic PT around childbirth, whether you're pregnant or postpartum, but there's a whole nother, like, I mean, there's the whole population of in the running community and the gymnastics community, like dancers, all of these people like deal with pelvic pain and oftentimes just think that it's part of their sport. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it does, you don't have to be in pain all the time. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, you don't have to leak 
fun either. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, let's talk a little bit before we wrap up um, just about uh, pregnancy and postpartum and how that's, I mean, obviously I said you're, you're a new mom. I'm a new mom. Our, our kids are similar age. Your little boy just turned a year, which is very yeah. exciting. Um, yeah. But uh, even more so, you know, for, for everyone, we can benefit from pelvic physical therapy. But I think especially any woman who is pregnant or postpartum, um, you know, you, you have like one checkup, maybe two checkups after you give birth and yeah. they, they maybe uh-huh. check and just make sure everything looks fine. And they're like, okay, go on your way. And there is so much more. Um, yeah. And I'm still learning this and it's been... Um, you know, almost two years, but yeah. I think it's uh, something that impacts every woman differently. And the inf- like now, I like the information you have, like learning about this as a professional, but then also going through it with your own story and journey. Um, I think is really, a, I mean, again, an incredible mix of of knowledge that you have um, to help people. Yeah. Yeah. It it has been like, it's another experience that just helps me be better at my job, um, which is kind of cool. So I had, I I think nobody's, I don't know any person whose birth has gone exactly how it was, they wanted it to. um, But I definitely had um, uh, what I would consider a traumatic birth at the end, a long labor and a traumatic birth. Um, And the thing that I thought afterwards was this is going to make me a better pelvic PT. Um, so, so going through pregnancy and postpartum, I mean, it was, it was a definitely a learning experience. Um, and I think that every person's ability and every person's experience is different and unique. Um, and I guess, um, through the pregnancy journey, like it's been very interesting to see like in the athletic population and just people who kind of post on social media, um, the differences of, um, ability or like what people feel like they can do. Like, um, I know you have said, you've told me before that like you were able to push yourself like with biking, um, and you were able to run through a good portion of your pregnancy. And, and I, I probably ran like up to six months of my pregnancy. Um, and I was thinking about people like women who have run like up until the day they gave birth. And I'm like, oh my God, my pelvis would never <laughs> feel good doing that. Um, but every person is so different. And mm-hmm. I think um, what I've heard you say before, like it's just important to not only talk about um, the – the amazing accomplishments that moms have been able to do athletically, but also talk about the hardships. And um, I think Amy Liedem is a great example of like, she's, she puts herself out there and she talks about the struggles being like two years postpartum. And um, it's, for me, it's been very up and down. Like I'm one that shies away from like an injury right away because I know it's not going to help to just run through pain, but that comes with a lot of frustration and struggles too, because I want to be like, I love running and it's the thing that makes me feel like myself um, the most out of any activity. Um, But it's not always accessible for me. Um, And I know that I'm not alone in that. Um, Mm -hmm. And there's just so many highs and lows, like through pregnancy, immediately postpartum. And then even now, like a year later, um, it's still up and down, but like finding, um, I think people to, to go outside with, whether it's running or hiking or like going to lunch, like with you, (laughs) it's been really helpful to like find friends that are in like similar situations. Um, and then knowing like, okay, all of these experiences are going to help, help me help others as well. Yeah, I I think you kind of nailed it with um like it's great to celebrate women who can do these incredible things while they're pregnant and newly postpartum of being able to like look I have a 3 week old and I'm running already but it's also kind of 
like cautionary because that makes the person who can't run feel inadequate of like, well, yeah. you know, I see all of these other people getting back and here I am just, you know, like five months and I still can't run. And so I think we need to, we don't, we don't need to not celebrate that those great accomplishments, but we also need to make sure that we are saying, Hey, you know what? You just grew a human, birthed a human, and you're still like feeding and growing it after it's born. Yeah. Like that is, yeah. and that is amazing. And, um, you know, your body goes through a lot. Like you said, it's you, like your, your experience was a traumatic birth experience, but I think any birth is going to be somewhat traumatic on the body. You know, it's totally, it's, it's an it's not an athletic injury, but it is an injury to your body. It takes time yeah. to heal and recover. And yes. um, going back to like the pelvic uh, PT and support, I think again that's something that like in our society is really hard to do because uh, we saw the same person and she wasn't in she wasn't local. Like we had to drive a couple right. hours and then you're thinking about, okay, so I'm driving with my new baby or I'm getting a babysitter. And then I have to think about pumping and I have to pay for this out of pocket because insurance doesn't support it. So there is like, I mean, we could go on and on about this. There's, uh, there's yeah. so much that makes it challenging as a new mother uh, to totally. take care of your body. Um, but to connect it back to running, I think if you do have a desire to to run um, and to perform and to, you know, get back to something that you were previously doing like mileage wise or training wise. It's so important to do these things in the first year to take care yeah. of the body, to go see someone who can help you because a doctor isn't really going to do too much. And, yeah. you know, there's a lot that happens <clears throat> And it can yeah. really help. I I had a few appointments that for me were just eye opening of like, oh wow, like that made a huge difference. And yeah. you know, I never would have done that. And having yeah. a, a PT clear you for running is probably the better option of just you know making yeah. sure that everything internally is is back to normal and is not going to cause an injury down the road. Yeah, there was um a mom. I I joined a mom's group. Um, and there was a mom this was like immediately postpartum. I think she, her, her OB cleared her to run at two weeks postpartum. And she said, she said that she went for a run and she thought she was bleeding, but then she realized she was just leaking everywhere. And I'm like, Oh my God, your OB, like, do not listen to them. I mean, I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> I, I am saying that, um, that your OB is clearing you for like, major red flags. If you want like some more guidance, I mean, leaking is a clear indicator that your pelvic floor cannot handle the load that you're putting through it. Um, and just a pelvic PT is going to give you a lot more guidance of like, is your body really ready to start a return to run? And it's probably not at six weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's hard for runners because we all want to get back there as soon as possible, but you're playing the long game. And so if you go out running three weeks postpartum and your pelvic floor and your whole body just gets overloaded, you're just more likely to develop prolapse, which you don't want to deal with long-term, which is where like prolapse, your organs are held up by ligaments. And so as your pelvic floor gets more loaded through your pregnancy or if you have like a really long pushing in delivery or you go back to running or high impact activities too soon, your pelvic floor can't support those organs. So those ligaments get lengthened and then your organs are falling on your vaginal wall. And it's just, I mean, you want to avoid it if you can, not all, all people can avoid it. And there are things that you can do with pelvic PTs and pessaries and things like that. Um, but your body will just thank you if you take the more um, uh, conservative approach to getting back to it. Because running will be there for you. It just, you want to treat your body well because it did just grow human and <laughs> deliver a human. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I agree. And it's, you know, it, it, 
the the long game is is exactly it and those first few months anyways i mean there's a lot going on a lot of changes a lot of adaptations you're figuring out a new life and i think sometimes it's like a training is on that amount of stress as is is pretty hard but then going through the physical part as well i i agree with you that waiting longer isn't necessarily a bad thing if you can look at it as like i'm doing this right now so that i can run again. Yeah. Um, and and feel- that doesn't mean you can't move your body. Like you can very much, like once you have been cleared, you can get in the pool or you can get on a stationary bike or a bike and, and move to, but, but everybody is different. So, so one person's movement like might be very different than another person's. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's all, it's crazy. And it lots, lots to learn. Um, and like you yeah. said, every person is different. So I think sharing these stories and not just the the happy, easy stories is um, really helpful for people to hear. Yeah. Yeah. And even someone like myself who does this for my living, like I still get injured and I get frustrated and um, have setbacks. And um, so, so I learn from it and I help other people from it, but I still deal with it myself. Yeah, and that's just an just an honest thing of of um, you know being an athlete and using your body that's going to have some wear and tear and using those yeah. experiences though to to help shape your future and to to learn so that you can do it a little bit differently the next time around. Exactly. Well, Claire, thank you so much for taking the time to share your knowledge with us today. Um, I learn something every time I talk to you. Um, today, I learned a lot of things. So uh, thank, well, thank you. you. Yeah, and, yeah. And where can people find you? Yeah. So um, my business is Activate Physical Therapy and Wellness in Fairfax, California. My Instagram is Activate Physical Therapy. Um I said this earlier, but I'm pretty bad with social media, but I do post some videos there. Um, And then I have a YouTube channel with a couple more videos too. Um, You can probably find that through my website, activateptw.com. And so I do in-person sessions in Fairfax, which is just north of San Francisco. And I do virtual sessions um, through that business as well as Gate Happens. And I will link to those in the show notes so people can check it out and um, get in contact with you. But thank you again. And um, yeah, enjoy your your afternoon. I'm going to enjoy my evening (laughs) wrapping up here. It's getting pretty late. So um, thank you again. And um, really appreciate uh, walking through this and and talking to us about... um, yeah, just some some things runners can be aware of with their bodies. All right, there you have it. Uh, some great information for all of us to take and use, hopefully. Um, I know after this call, I'm going to go do my toe yoga and uh, do some soleus calf raises because uh, I've been slacking on them. Um, and that's that's something that I need to make sure to do. Um, and I'm sure all of us could take take some time to do some of these little things that can really make a big difference for us uh, in terms of preventing injuries and um, getting the most out of our our running. So thanks again to Claire for walking us through some of these things today. And again, you can find her at activatephysicaltherapy.com. And you can find her on Instagram. As she says, though, she's not super active. You can find some videos. Um, But check her out. Check her website out. uh, Schedule a virtual consultation. Or if you're in the the Bay Area, uh, come see her in person. And again... uh, Thanks to Claire and hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Get out for a nice run, get some fresh air and we'll, well, I'll talk to you later because I'll be back. 